Bonsoir. <rire> Merci d'être avec nous ce soir en, en si grand nombre. C'est un petit peu intimidant, je dois dire. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Je m'appelle Audrey Genois. Je suis directrice générale de Momenta Biennale de l'Image. Momenta et le Musée d'art contemporain de Montréal sont fiers d'accueillir, de vous accueillir à cette conférence Dito Steril, qui sera en conversation avec la commissaire de Momenta 2023, Jiyun Han. Cette conférence est réalisée en collaboration avec le Goethe Institute, qui sont avec nous ce soir, et Art Speaks. I would like to thank especially Liliane Mauer for her support. J'aimerais aussi remercier la, la BANQ qui nous accueille ici ce soir. Welcome to this talk with the artist Ito Storiel, who will be in conversation with the curator of this year's edition of Momenta, Jiyun Han. I would like to warmly thank Ito for her presence with us today. We are very proud to present the installation Social Sim as part of Momenta and co-produce with the MAC. I invite now Leslie Johnston, curator and head of exhibitions and education at the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal, to say a few words about our partnership, the Social Sim exhibition, and the, their collaboration with Ito in the past. Merci, Audrey. Uh, heureuse de tout vous voir ici. Um, je suis aussi la présidente de Momenta, donc il y a un petit peu de conflit d'intérêts dans mon, mon, ma, ma fierté de, de Momenta. Um, on est toujours très heureux de collaborer avec Momenta. Je pense que ça, c'est, ça, c'est vraiment un moment très fort de notre saison. Donc, uh, allez voir toutes nos expositions qui sont un petit peu partout. Um, c'est un vrai honneur, c'est un honneur de présenter uh, Social Sim dans un petit espace à côté de notre espace à PVM, à Place Ville-Marie. Thank you, Hito, for agreeing to, to exhibit this amazing work in our pop-up space. It looks, uh, it looks great. It's beyond what we, were, we expected and hoped, and we had to work very hard in order to bring a kind of wonky space into a very um, immersive demanding and also funny um, installation that, uh, that Hito has brought to us. This is the second time we've worked with Hito. Uh, la première fois était dans la présentation de Liquidity Inc. qui était dans le Biennale de Montréal en 2014, qu'on est heureux d'avoir acquis et que John Zapatelli, notre directeur, nous a, a présenté dans une expo en 2020, juste avant la fermeture de notre, de notre édifice. C'est un œuvre qui est extraordinaire. On voudrait continuer d'acquérir des œuvres de, de Hito. Euh, je pense que j'arrêterai là. L'ex- l'exposition est vraiment dans un espace à côté de chez nous. On est en montage en ce moment pour l'exposition de Pussy Riot qui va ouvrir en octobre. Donc, venez euh, en grand nombre voir, euh, voir euh, Social Sim et puis revenez euh, le 24 ou 25 octobre pour euh, Pussy Riot. Before introducing our guests, it's important to remember that Momenta's activities take place on unceded territories of the Gayangayaga Nation. These lands and waterways are the home of indigenous people from across the globe and have long served as a meeting site for many nations. We are committed to cultivating and maintaining anti-colonial structures and are grateful for the privilege we have to be able to work in this territory. For tonight's presentation, Ito and Jiyun have prepared a discussion around a selection of works in relation with the installation Social Sim and the theme of the Biennale. This will be a one-hour talk. Afterwards, the public will have 30-minute period to ask questions to, your, uh, to our guests. Vous aurez à votre disposition deux micros dans la salle pour poser vos questions. Vous pourrez les poser en français ou en anglais. Maintenant, quelques mots sur nos invités. Ji Yun Han lives and works in Jojagi Monyang, Montreal. In her often inter- interdisciplinary curatorial research projects, she sh- seeks to uncover how images drive and guide us in shifting social, cultural, and psychic context. Previously a curator at Fondry Darling, she organized 
exhibition of works by Cynthia G. Renard, Barbara Steinman, and Guillaume Adjudar Provo, as well as a performative cycle of listening and sound art practices. She has contributed to monographs on Geneviève Cadieux, Louise Robert, and most recently, Frédéric Cordier. As a matter of fact, there is a book launch tomorrow at the Library Port de Tête. You are all invited. Oh, Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> it's written. It's written Wednesday. Sorry. In her PhD dissertation, she investigated how images competed between 1929 and 1936, articulating photography, surrealism, and the nascent cultures of the illustrated press and advertising. She is currently a research fellow for, fellow for the Photography and Commission project with the support of Les Amis du Centre Pompidou in Paris. And of course, she is our precious curator of this uh, edition of Momenta. Ito Sturel studied at the Academy of Vis Visual Arts in Tokyo and the University of Television and Film in Munich. She also completed a doctorate in philosophy at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. She currently lives and works in Berlin. Ito's videos, performance, and philosophical works expose the paradoxes of virtualization of reality under the influence of digital image and media network. Ito inv invites invents <laughs> highly tonic forms that create a narrative for what an image, an image is and does today. Ito's investigations target the often, often militarized economies of image in a globalized world, the sibylline metaphors of digital capital, capitalism on the galloping privatization on, of public spaces such as art museums. Ito has held teaching position at several institutions, inclu including QUVA, Helsinki, University of Arts Berlin, Royal Academy of Copenhagen, Goldsmith College London, and the University of Arts Berlin. The artist has presented solo exhibition in an impressive list of institutions around the world. The video installation Social Sims that we are exhibiting with the Mac as part of Momenta has been shown previously in Germany, Paris, Amsterdam, and Seoul. She participated in several biennales such as Art Encounters, Biennale of Timisio Ara, La Biennale di Venezia, Guangzhou Biennale, Sao Paulo Biennale, the Berlin Biennale, and now Momenta Biennale. She is represented by Andrew Krebs Gallery in New York and Esther Schipper in Berlin, uh, Berlin, Paris, and Seoul. Merci d'accueillir chaleureusement nos invités, Ito Steriel et Jiyun Han. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce qu'on m'entend? Oui, je pense que le micro fonctionne. Merci beaucoup, uh, Audrey and Leslie. Thank you for your gracious uh, introduction. Uh, this event tonight is the result of incredible partnership, so I'd like to also thank warmly all the uh, partners that made this event possible. Hito, this is such a privilege and a pleasure to have you here with us tonight in Montreal for this dialogue on your work and your participation to this year's Momenta Biennale de l'Image. Thank you for making it all your way here, and welcome to Montreal. Please warmly welcome Hito Hito. So what we're going to do for the next hour is, of course, talk about Social Sim, the fabulous video installation that uh, we are presenting at the Mac right now, and pull some threads that connect this work to the metamorphic theme of the Biennale in relation to uh, masquerades, mimicry, and with the transformation of ident identities. Mimicry in particular has been a motif in your work, and I feel it has it hasn't been much discussed yet, so I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity to explore it uh, with you. Uh, one other aim uh, of our conversation will be to get our hands on this notion of identity, which the Biennale exhibitions address as process and not a fixed ontology, as becoming rather than being. 
And so just to connect uh, very quickly uh, with uh, some of your past um, uh, statements, in 2017, in the introduction to uh, the IFLUX journal on strange universalism uh, that you co-signed with IFLUX editors, uh, you wrote, and I will just quote uh, you very briefly, today, the most important question is not what belongs to whom, but who belongs to what as in what kind of group. Sameness trumps equality. Similarity beats solidarity. Reality is a battlefield. If the era of the October Revolution was epitomized by Malivish's Black Square, the current one is ruled by reality TV. And a bit uh, further down, you write, you write Technologies boost identities and make them happen. Identities, in turn, obscure technologies. End of quote. So I think like, there's lots uh, in this already to unpack, and that will uh, bring us to social sim. Uh, we will be bringing in to the table a select number uh, of other works in film and video installation, including very recent ones, uh, but also much older ones who will do a bit of uh, time travel together. Uh, so let's begin with, uh, without further ado, with How Not to Be Seen, a fucking didactic educational mob file. Uh, this is a video piece you created in 2013, so 10 years ago. Uh, we'll start uh, right there. Um, and this work has become a reference work in terms uh, of what it means to make an image, to be visible, and invisible in a digitally based surveillance society. Um, so briefly, as an introduction, I'm sure like most of you remember or uh, know this uh, work almost by heart, uh, but using the format of a five chapter guerrilla manual, uh, this work explains very straightforwardly and playfully ways of becoming invisible. And it brings viewers also in an environment that is mimicking a green screen studio setup. So I'm Maybe I'll invite you to, to show a little excerpt and, and also let us know uh, how you look uh, at this work today, Hito. Okay. Well. <laughs> Sorry, I've talked for too long no, already. No <laughs> yeah, let me just welcome everyone. Thank you for this very warm and generous welcome. I very much appreciate. And thanks also for having me back so many times in this city. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how Not to be Seen is an old work, as you said. I made it 10 years ago. It's uh, very simple, I guess. It um, was a work that tried to explain in five chapters how not to be seen. <laughs> it's a title I actually ripped from the Monty Pythons, who did a, did a sketch of <laughs> the same title, which is actually quite funny. Um, well, anyway, I'm just going to show you a brief clip of it, because I haven't seen it for quite a while either, so I'm kind of <laughs> curious <laughs> to see what's in I think we need sound. Around 2000, a new standard for resolution targets is introduced. This is a pixel-based resolution chart. It serves to shoot pixels. In 1996, photographic resolution in the area is about 12 meters per pixel. Today it is one foot. To become invisible, one has to become smaller or equal to one pixel. Thank you. 
How not to be seen. Lesson 4. There are 13 ways of becoming invisible by disappearing. Living in a gated community. Living in a military zone. Being in an airport, factory or museum. Owning an anti-paparazzi handbag. Being fitted with an invisibility cloak. Being a superhero. Being female and over 50. Surfing the dark web. Being a dead pixel. Being a Wi-Fi signal moving through human bodies. Being undocumented or poor. Being spam caught by a filter. Being a disappeared person as an enemy of the state. Eliminated. Liquidated. And then dissimulated. In the decades of the digital revolution 170,000 people disappear. Disappeared people are annihilated, eliminated, eradicated, deleted, dispensed with, filtered, processed, selected, separated, wiped out. Invisible people retreat into 3D animations. They hold the vectors of the mesh and keep the picture together. They re-emerge as pixels. To here, the loop is complete with pixels. Yeah. Started with pixels. So, how does it feel <laughs> to look at that <laughs> 10 years after? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I remember how we shot this. I mean, it's, uh, because I, I was shooting this uh, pixel dance with a choreographer, a friend of our, mine called Arthur Steldi in Berlin. And I told him, please invent a choreography for people who cannot dance at all. <laughs> and this is what he did. <laughs> Very convincing. <laughs> uh, so dance, of course, is a motif that connects uh, this work with a social sim that is uh, being presented as part of masquerades. Uh, but um, I wanted to start uh, the conversation with uh, this work because when thinking uh, of masquerades, notions of mimicry, of camouflage, mm -hmm. um, for the biennial, uh, of course, uh, this piece has kind of, kind of come to mind very quickly uh, as a reference point as to how to bridge this idea of mimicry with um, what happens to our identities in a surveillance society that we live in. So identity is not only a matter, a cultural matter, or a matter of the identity politics uh, that uh, we're very um, intensely uh, living through right now, uh, but uh, how can we connect uh, these issues with uh, broader issues that concerns any human uh, being uh, on this planet right now, which is uh, what happens with our own identities uh, in the digital world and a world governed by surveillance. And I wonder how you could kind of maybe articulate uh, for us like this politics of representation um, based uh, on, the, on this work. 
I guess it's quite simple, honestly, because, you know, there was a lot of discussion about making things visible, representing things, representing unrepresented people and issues, and I was just trying to complicate it a little more, right? To, um, to make the point that invisibility can also have benefits and that it's basically both coming together, you know, being visible in a way that's actually survivable, but also being invisible in times or in, in uh, situations where it matters could both have benefits. And this point of opacity was something that I felt was, is still important, you know, to make every now and then. Yet in this uh, piece in particular, there are very identifiable persons and characters, starting with yourself, mm -hmm. uh, that you're very present uh, in this video. Uh, we've seen a little bit of uh, figures wearing burkas, so they're also very kind of strongly connoted figures. And the, at the end of the video piece, we have like the three, um, I keep forgetting the name, the three de degrees vocal group that is singing uh, onto the screen. And so um, it seems that there's a kind of a tension between like this, uh, all these lessons on how to become visible and the kind of extra visibility of uh, yourself and these other figures in this uh, this work. Yeah, I mean, the whole one of the main ideas was that it's not a binarism, you know, mm -hmm. between being visible and visible, but you can basically also becoming invisible by becoming an image. It's a bit more twisted, right? But it was trying to explore ways which were sort of beyond the binary, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> becoming image is an expression I use a lot. Also, um, so there's a necessity to become image as a survival tactics uh, in the face of surveillance. How about the desire to become image? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit more complicated now, 10 years later, I think. Uh, that desire has a bit receded, I guess. Yeah, in maybe not to be an image would be more interesting point of view now. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, and going back to this choreographical aspect that uh, mm -hmm. we've seen in the excerpt you showed to us, can you talk to us about your interest in choreography? So, um. Yes, I mean, um, in, in terms of storytelling, it's almost necessary in a way, no? Always to have a movement part that also tells the story or parts of the story or, you know, t takes one bit of the story and runs with it at the same time. So it's not just um, verbal. It's not just told. It's being enacted. It's being basically performed. And how do these work together, the verbal and the corporeal language? I don't know. <laughs> it depends, you know. You, you've seen they rub sometimes against each other. Other times they probably just ignore one another, which is also fine. Um, so maybe we'll jump seven years later, because I feel this kind of correspondence between verbal language and uh, corporeal language is something that's very uh, uh, strong also in social sim, uh, a piece that is based on dyslexia, so... Uh, language and also on dancing mania, so maybe we can mm -hmm. uh, shift to that piece. Um, just a few words of introduction for the, those who haven't seen the work yet. Uh, this piece, so um, he too realized it in 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, it explores the chaotic. Oops. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. It explores the chaotic situation during the COVID-19 pandemic and the transformation and the virtualization of art museums during that time. So there are many metamorphoses that, that are going on uh, in this piece. Um, maybe one thing that struck me when I re-watched uh, it uh, in preparation for this uh, conversation are that opposite to how not to be seen, the characters are all very generic. Uh, in this piece. Mm -hmm. 
Well, maybe not. But anyway, we, we can maybe first have a look at it. So mm -hmm. basically, because I'm starting in the middle at some point, the plot, the, the plot doesn't matter, actually. <laughs> so there's some people being uh, airdropped into a museum. They are supposed to find a painting, but they can't. They become hired as freelance performers instead and uh, start performing a dancing mania. And that's where we start. Squad retrained as a performance collective. Dancing manias came upon people after the plagues along the river Rhine. This performance shows how it spread, and along with it disinformation, conspiracy theory and scapegoating. Press I to infect a random squad member. People started dancing and never stopped again. Today this model can be used to predict many things. This is how racism spreads as pandemia. This is how conspiracy theories proliferate. This is a K-pop band sandbox for fan armies. Meanwhile strange things happen in the VIP room. Help. I have been kidnapped. I don't know where I am but I need to save the world. Instead I am getting dragged towards a feudal AI free port with decimated human rights standards. I want to lower my price ASAP. I swear to god I only saw Leo once when he brushed up my finger. I am proudly studio. Inside the performance art department the squad is performing for their lives. We are dancing for hire. For everyone that wants to model their shit. We get infected, we dance, we recover and then we get reinfected. It's about the survival of the fittest. The VIP room manages to send out appeals for help on Twitch. Hilfe, ich wurde entführt. Ich werde in Berlin festgehalten und Leute wie ich sind dort nicht besonders sicher. Manchmal verbrennen sie in Polizeihaft. It turns out Nefertiti is piloted by Heja. In der letzten Folge war ich nicht zu sehen, weil ich in türkische Gefängnis war. Ich konnte entkommen und würde zum scheiß Flüchtling. Meanwhile, Artworks transition from automated to autonomous. In Generation 1 this thing started to crawl. In Generation 48, it had eaten its whole family. In Generation 450, it sold at auction. In Generation 4400, it sold its owner. In Generation 44500, it turned into a mid-size constitutional monarchy.
So who okay. is the choreographer here? Yeah, good question. It's a sine wave, actually. So this um, um, animation that was used for this um, choreo mania or dancing mania is actually a procedural animation which runs on a sine wave and basically articulates these jumping and um, hopping movements. And mm -hmm. it's also tied to it, or is it supposed to be tied to? No, no, I mean, it's parameters. very, very strongly tied to this moment, to the idea of infection, to movement spreading infectiously through a crowd. Um, but of course, I mean, this was the pandemic, but this is mainly about infodemia, right? About conspiracy theories, of which we have seen a huge lot in Europe, anti-vax, uh, all, all sorts of different things, and how these things basically spread through um, people like wildfire. And this was a way of trying to visualize this kind of movement and infect infectiosity or infectivity. So the installation is in two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an immersive environment uh, initially made of live simulations. And at the back of the space, uh, there is a narrative video that's connected to the immersive environment that uh, bears a title that is Rebellion Dancing Mania. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this in iteration at the Mac, you turned a five-channel video into a six-channel mm -hmm. video. We added, uh, well, you added uh, one, uh, one face uh, of the cube. But can you talk a little bit about the space you've created? Because, of course, your video work, like, over time has been include like has become more and more architectural uh, but in this case there's a real like kind of a void space but also field space that is created uh, mm -hmm. at the back of a video and not in front of the video as a as for the seating or uh, mm -hmm. as it used to be before well, I think both, of course, are connected. The simulation or the dancing, this sort of disco space is explained and contextualized in the video. Um, but in the earlier editions, the simulation was also live, meaning it was changing every day. There were parameters which were adjusted to the sides, which changed every day. So basically, the movement of the people would also um, change over time. In Germany, this was very much tied to the spread of conspiracy theory and death threats and, and stuff like that. So we would input these numbers into our simulation. It was a real, basically, infection simulation we had that was running live. And then the parameter or the dances would basically change according to that. And so in France, it was based on numbers about police violence at riots at that time. You know, people being wounded and blinded by stun grenades and, you know, numbers like that. So what we have here in Montreal is a video version of yes. the simulations. Um, so they give a visualization of what is called social sim, uh, social sims. What what are social sims? Yeah, I became very fascinated with so social simulations, which are basically algorithms that calculate simplified social interactions, right? And it, they, they exist for basically everything, but whether it's you know um, something called sugar scape, where mm, basically mm, animals eat stuff in a landscape and metabolize and so on. But I was most mostly, of course, fascinated by social ones like class inequality, um, but also rebellion. Rebellion was actually the social simulation that I found most interesting, which simulates the parameters which you need to manipulate to uh, basically stop a rebellion. So that's in the real simulation, right? In the real one, it's stuff like the length of the prison term, for example. I mean, you make it bigger, then the re rebellion gets smaller. And I was also completely fascinated by 
the way that this was visualized, because it was completely abstract, it was just basically pixels that were um, moving like noise, it had some sort of very abstract character and composition. So all of this um, was really fascinating for me. In a previous work, I also worked with a person which I found on the internet who was actually doing military simulations for, for the Turkish military. And it was um, more or less emergency simulations, evacuation simulations, but also ballistic simulations. So it was all about trying to reduce a potential military situation and to abstract it so that it could basically run and make its own predictions. The level of abstraction in social sim is kind of very twisted because contrary to how not to be seen, we don't have real actors or mm -hmm. actors are working towards their own uh, disappearance. We see how Hija, the human, is kind of animating Nefertiti in the excerpt you, you showed to us. There's also this actor, police actor, uh, Mark Vashke, who's animating like avatars of police um, policemen. And all these uh, characters that we see in the video, in the simulations, are avatars of uh, policemen and workers, including uh, the Salvatore and Mundi. Uh, yes, but I think that was, or oh, actually it is the moment we're living in, the moment of massive automation, you know, on every, on every level. And during the pandemic, it was very obvious um, in, in the sense that all these digital environments appeared very quickly and, you know, theater actors were thinking about how to continue working. And so basically every, everyone is trying to automate something and still subsist in being basically the automator. Um, but all of this is temporary. And it's kind of funny because I was imagining um, a museum of self-generating uh, artworks. They were based on generative algorithms and they would just evolve on their own, make artists um, superfluous, of course. Um, this was before the NFT moment even. So when I see it, I have, I'm, I'm still laughing a bit <laughs> about that. Um, but I mean, now with um, with the rise of large language models and you know the transformer models and so-called artificial intelligence, we're seeing a whole new push from a different direction towards automation of a lot of other functions. So basically, the moment of automation is still ongoing. It happens on different levels, which have their ups and downs. But uh, I think we're, we haven't exited it. We're still in there. Automation isn't perfect. Uh, social sim starts, the narrative video starts with an AI that's being trained to pronounce the word social sim, and that's failing <laughs> at pronouncing social sim and keeps repeating socialism. Can you talk a little bit about the use value of dyslexia? <laughs> Sometimes it's useful, no? <laughs> Um, but maybe it's a good entry also to get into how you create narrative, because in your all of your works, like homophonies or mm -hmm. like slightly divergent pronunciations, are really mm -hmm. motors in the narration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if you. <laughs> If, if you're basically a foreigner in most languages, then you start somehow merging them. And you, you transit basically from one to another through portals, which sort of sound the same. <laughs> yeah, from the literal yeah. to the metaphoric uh, also. Uh, and one other strategy that's very strong in social sim is how you continuously go backwards. Yes. This was something, I've, you know, this work, I couldn't shoot anything. Um, the only thing I could do is record stuff on Zoom and also simulate or animate something. And also I had my whole, um, basically, um, archive of outtakes from previous works. 
So that's what I used. It's <laughs> a lot of it is outtakes from previous works. And I, I found a structure to sort of be able to deal with it, which is basically the whole work consists of recaps of, like in a television series. Uh, it always starts off by the recap of the previous episode, but in this work there's only recaps. So the episodes do not exist, but only the recaps of the previous episodes. And the previous episodes are basically my former works, so there is a whole number of people who re-emerge from past works and so on. It's like a retrospective of your own work. And it w the work was commissioned for a retrospective of your work. Yeah, actually. yeah, but my works do not exist. <laughs> retrospective, <laughs> just some recaps. Uh, how about uh, the importance of this recap uh, strategy uh, in the face of predictive algorithms? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, everything, every sort of archive or any kind of material is now basically becoming training data, right? So there is a whole reconfiguration of what archive is, what recap is, what you know memory is, and so on. And that's basically reshuffling all sorts of parameters quite a lot. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about so the episode was never shot, so there's no there's no main story. It's a series of recap. Uh, but also uh, in spatial terms, um, social sim is taking us from one void space to another. So there's the space of the immersive uh, installation, uh, of course, which is a space of simulation. But throughout the nar narrative video, we also go from one bubble to, the, to an aquarium, to a VIP room, uh, on a, an internet platform to a, an empty museum, uh, to a Twitch, pla uh, Twitch platform, to a VR headset. Anyways, there are so many uh, different media that are kind of you, you bring in into that video. Um, how are all these spaces related mm -hmm. to each other? Probably they aren't. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <laughs> that's probably the connection point, right? If in How Not To Be Seen, you had always these lists of things which were visible or invisible, as I'm seeing. Then you have these lists of media which you cannot see, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, to dig a little bit deeper uh, into this aspect... Oh, also, sorry, yeah, that, go that ahead. was also the fate of the work, that it ended up almost being unseen because it was closed most of the times, right? <laughs> yeah, so that was, that, that's what happened. It succeeded in being cloaked. <laughs> um, so to dig a little bit deeper into the dancing mania aspect uh, of the work and the spaces for masquerades, uh, I'd like to bring us back uh, in time to two older works uh, you made. Uh, so maybe we'll start with November. Okay. Um, November is a video that you made in 2004. Mm -hmm. And just briefly to give a little bit of context, um, it's a piece that revisits images of your friend Andrea Wolf uh, in three different roles. So we see her as the heroine warrior of your first film in 1983, uh, which was a feminist martial art film shot in Super 8. Uh, we also see Andrea as an armed resistance fighter from the Kurdish Free Women's Units, uh, as a low-res image uh, that's taken on Kurdish cable TV shot by a German producer. And finally, we see her photo as a martyr and icon uh, whose image is multiplied on posters during anti-Turkish demonstrations in Germany. So it's a whole piece about traveling well, traveling images, how uh, someone is kind of swallowed up into these uh, circles and circuits uh, of the image. But it's also a piece about dance <laughs> in parts. Let me do, let's yes. just watch four or five minutes.
My best friend when I was 17 was a girl called Andrea Wolf. In 1998, she was shot as a Kurdish terrorist. This is my first film. This is me. This is Andrea. It's impossible to reconstruct the story of the film. Only the fighting scenes were shot showing a gang of three girls trying to clumsily beat up every male they can get their hands on. The film is silent because the only spools we could steal had no sound. And Andrea was its charismatic, strong and beautiful center. The last time I have seen Andrea was two years before she went underground five years before she was executed in Kurdistan. They took her prison, one could hear a voice. The voice of comrade Ronayi was full of fear. She screamed. First her voice fell sound, then the one of comrade Diak. Then comrade Ronayi was killed. There are strange coincidences with the material we shot almost 15 years earlier, back in Bavaria, where we grew up. In the film, we are constantly fighting, probably for justice, and the ethic code of the film is that only villains use weapons, and the good guys and girls use their bare hands for fighting. In this film it is I who gets shot, and Andrea survives. She picks up the weapon, executes the villain, and rides off into the sunset on a motorbike. Her body never came back. What came back instead was this poster. It says, Mataya Ronahi, taken prisoner by Turkish security forces as a fighter in the Free Women's Army Kurdistan and murdered. The fallen revolutionaries are immortal. So actually it's not so much about dance, but fighting scenes. But also in the film, we see a lot of dancing um, from uh, other movies, like Eisenstein's uh, October uh, film, where you see Bolshevik dance, uh, as well as, um, I think there's a Bruce Meyer campy sexploitation film where you see also dancers uh, that are like very kind of... Um, um, yeah, animating <laughs> the, uh, the, the film. Um, how uh, are dance and rebellion connected? Dance and? How is dance and rebellion? Oh, it's a very general question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm well, for sure. you, maybe. In uh, let me just go back to mm -hmm. these examples. I, I remember a quote from Eisenstein's film October where the Cossacks are dancing before joining the uprising. And there is a brief scene where the female guerrillas are sort of dan doing this round dance in the mountains. And there is, yeah, yeah, from 
not here to come faster. Pussycat, kill, kill, Rasmaya. There's some kind of pole dance, dancing in there. I think dance was not so important for this film. Mm -hmm. It was more the choreographies of martial art and how they, you know, relate to dancing, but also to to fighting. You know, they are basically on the. Um, they they belong to both. Dance turns into fight, and but also the other way around. And it's also a film where you see how fiction is kind of informing reality and the reverse. So even the film that you created uh, back in those days was completely mimicking other kinds of films that were um, already existing. Um, and there are excerpts of Bruce Lee films. Uh, there are also excerpts from this situationist film that is um, appropriating samurai images uh, into this very uh, funny critique. Um, so there's this whole history of cinema that is deployed by mimicking the, the, the bodily gestures of the actors uh, in them. Yeah, I think it was called Can Dialectic Break Breaks? It's a great it's a really funny film. I think it's on YouTube. Just go check it out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole film is about how you learn basically doing something, in this case fighting, I, I suppose, by following role models also from cinema and also role models which are quite unsuspected, right, or surprising. But because if there is no one who you can follow directly, then you also use, I don't know, role models like Bruce Lee, who are probably not the first candidates one might think of. And at the end also there's this um, uh, revolutionary, uh, well, guerrilla warrior who says how he got inspired by a film by Costa Gavras in how oh, yes. uh, kidnapping. Yeah, yeah, so I was talking to a person from the a militant movement called 2nd of June in Germany, and he told me how they were really actually taking their cues from films from Latin America. Costa Gavras was one of them, because they didn't know how to do it, you know? I mean, okay, you kidnap someone for ransom, but how do you transport this person? You go, you go to the movies, okay, he's being rolled up in a carpet, so... <laughs> You do the same, but then you notice that the carpet is too short and somehow the feet are dangling from the carpet. <laughs> what do you do? There's always this gap, you know, between the movie in which things seem to work, you know, and the reality. Somehow they don't, but you need to get it from somewhere, right? So I hope you, you're starting to see how, like, there's nothing ever <laughs> at the center, right? Uh, there's always copies of copies of mm -hmm. uh, images uh, that are kind of uh, placed uh, in the middle. And maybe it's time to go to this piece of 1998 you made, Die Lehre uh, the empty center that was a foundational work. Um, I read somewhere it was the last film you made because it was shot in 16 millimeter and then now it's transferred to, to video. Uh, so it's a, well, it's a, a, a piece you made 25 years ago, and that is really kind of the matrix of much of your work, I feel. Uh, shall we see the mm -hmm. excerpt? So it's an hour-long uh, film uh, that uh, you shot over a period of eight years. Is that right? Yes, eight years. Uh, and it shows... Uh, shifting borders in this empty center of Germany's capital city. Um, yeah, it was Berlin. shot on the territory of the former so-called Death Strip, the minefield between east and west, between both parts of the walls. It was pretty wide in, in a specific part of the city. And this is where the film is centered, and it deals with the reconstruction of this area over eight years, but also 
with the history of borders which, has ex which have existed there for a much longer time. Uh, colonial borders, all sorts of borders. Maybe, I don't know, four or five minutes. Because I think in the beginning you see how it's being put together. Es gibt viele Arten, eine Grenze zu durchbrechen. Es gibt viele Arten, neue Grenzen zu errichten. fällt die Berliner Mauer. Das Gelände zwischen den Mauern, ein leeres Minenfeld zwischen Ost und West, steht jetzt offen. Früher war das die Mitte der Stadt, das Zentrum ihrer Macht. Dann wurde der Ort zum leeren und tödlichen Randgebiet, zur Grenze. Jetzt kehrt die Mitte zurück. Alte Grenzen werden niedergerissen, sie werden abgetragen oder verschoben und gleichzeitig erscheinen neue Begrenzungen und Zäune. In der leeren Mitte Berlins verschieben sich die Grenzen und Begrenzungen. Am Potsdamer Platz überlagern sich die Bilder und die Zeiten. Das neue Zentrum Berlins wird über der arischen Trümmerwüste des Dritten Reiches errichtet. Während auf dem Todesstreifen die deutsche Geschichte fortgesetzt wird, überlagern sich die alten Grenzen mit den neuen. Die Polizistin, die ich nach dem Überfall äh, gegangen bin und äh, als ich vor Schmerz äh, wusste und stöhnte, hat sie gelacht. Sie sagte, ich habe mich alles heißt das, vorge vorgemacht. Nach dem Mauerfall äh, waren die Deutschen ganz aufgeregt. Ich habe das Gefühl, dass sie vergessen äh, haben, was sie sind. Und dann, ja, ich glaube, für die Ausländer wäre es ganz besser, wenn die Mauer noch da ist. Ja. Das war das praktische ganze Gefühl. Hier stand von 1734 bis 1869 eine Mauer. Zöllner stachen mit langen Spießen durch Gepäckstücke, um die Einfuhr illegaler Güter und die Ausfuhr illegaler Personen zu verhindern. Das Bauwerk wurde daher Zollmauer genannt. Nachdem die Zollmauer fällt, entsteht zwischen Potsdamer Platz und Reichstag das Zentrum Berlins, der Mittelpunkt politischer und militärischer Gewalt. Nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg bleibt zwischen den Sektorengrenzen eine Brache zurück, die in den 60er Jahren zum Todesstreifen umgebaut wird. Die Berliner Mauer sollte den Kapitalismus und Faschismus abhalten, allerdings mit wenig Erfolg. Als sie fällt, wird der leere Streifen zwischen den Mauern an Investoren verkauft. Zwei Monate später kehren die ersten Bauten auf den Platz zurück. Das 
Also erstmal wollten wir mit der Besetzung nur ein Zeichen setzen, ne? aber es gibt halt auch eine Menge Leute, die im Bauwagen wohnen und die auch Plätze brauchen. Und es gibt ja kaum Pl Plätze, wo du hingehen kannst. Es gehört ja jedes Fleckchen auf der Erde, gehört ja schon jemand. Und so ein Platz soll es halt sein, da wo du einfach hingehen kannst, wo dich keiner einfach vertragen kann. Mhm. Die Besitzer möchten ihre Gesichter nicht zeigen. Sie befürchten, identifiziert zu werden. Wir einigen uns darauf, ihre Bauwerke anstelle ihrer Gesichter zu zeigen. Der Platz ist ja jetzt hier der ehemalige Todesstreifen am Potsdamer Platz. Wem gehört denn der momentan? Ja, gehört also noch der DDR. Es ne? gelten aber als Sonderrechte, so nach, nach den Grenzgesetzen. Inzwischen ist das Teil schon äh, so gut wie verscherbelt an Daimler Benz. War. Und zwar für einen absoluten Spottpreis, so für ein Zehntel von einem normalen Preis. Also sie haben das praktisch äh, geschenkt gekriegt. Und ja, bis jetzt haben wir eigentlich, weil Berlin soll ja wieder so Drehscheibe des Kapitals werden. Ne? Und das ist natürlich klar, da kommt jetzt Daimler Benz hier ja. Ne? Wir haben einfach was dagegen, dass sich das wieder die Reichsten erreichen oder die Neger reißen. So eine Plätze. I don't know if we should rejoice because it's a visionary piece or be very <laughs> depressed because nothing has changed. Uh, the casting of this work is exactly the same, almost like social sim. There are workers, there are refugees, squatter, police, investors. Yeah, this is just a bit faster, no, more <laughs> frenzied, you know, also more aggressive, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, they knew they wouldn't be there, and they are not there. Instead, there is all these structures. I mean, shopping mall. <laughs> the shopping mall is not even functional. It's almost broke now after 20 years. So that's what, that's the transition, right? I was in place to document this process of transition. This is also why there are these long transitions to go from point A to point B, which are five, four, four, five years apart. So this empty space that is also becoming multi-layered with uh, ever changing, shifting borders uh, in itself. We've got only a few minutes left and I oh. just want to make sure okay. we speed up to okay. <laughs> the latest uh, speed you've uh, reached uh, with Animal Spirits mm -hmm. um, that was made two years after uh, Social Sim, so 2022. So that's not exactly your latest uh, piece, but uh, almost. And right this time we're in, reality, in a reality TV show completely and in a cave. Yeah, so again, I'm jumping to the middle of the piece and I have to tell you what happened. It's basically some real existing friends of mine in Spain who have something which they had something for many years, which they called the Shepherds Academy and found themselves suddenly with a reality film production taking their name and shooting a reality TV show of the same name in their neighborhood, in their valley. So that's basically the real um, life situation this starts from. And then again, pandemic and so on, then it gets fictionalized quite a lot. You know, then the, it, in real life, in fact, the reality company came, they shot several seasons of their reality TV show, whereby, you know, people from the city had to milk goats and roll cheese and would I don't know, depending on how many cheese they managed, they got points or something like that. And in my film, that happens, but uh, also there is an uh, NFT company barging in and trying to transform this whole mountain range into a metaverse crypto colosseum. So that's, that's basically where we are right now. And we see... Um, Nell, who is a real character, who is a YouTube star also. I mean, he has his own channel where he reports from his daily life and from, you know, his fights with bureaucracy, his fights against wolves. Wolves are a real problem uh, for him because he's also in a national park where they are extremely protected and so on. And um, basically, whatever he says is more or less from real life. Is not happy about the reality show. 
Bueno, pues visto que todo se va a convertir en un reality show, visto que por todos lados hay cámaras que nos controlan, cámaras que nos registran, lo que tratamos es de ver por la televisión la ley básica del darwinismo, es decir, que el más fuerte sobrevive y todos los demás desaparecen. Y por eso yo traigo este maquillaje que veis aquí, porque como tengo menos ganas de salir en un reality show que de tirarme por el pico más alto de aquí, pues esta pintura, desarrollada por un tipo muy listo, ruso, evita que los ordenadores de reconocimiento facial me reconozcan. Con esta pintura, así tipo Comanche o Cheyenne, pues los ordenadores se vuelven un poco tarumbas, que es lo que siempre yo quise, que los ordenadores se volviesen tarumbas para poder dejar de pagar impuestos. Y así me camuflo, y así evito que todos esos mangantes, sacacuartos y chupasubvenciones que quieren convertir esto en un plato de televisión, pues se aprovechen de mi imagen sin mi permiso. Y, añadiendo un detalle más, traigo aquí una piel lobuna, traigo aquí una piel lobuna, con la cual me voy a camuflar entre los hierros, me voy a camuflar en los días nublados y así a ver si con un poco de suerte, ya que como pastor la cultura mía no me la van a proteger, a ver si como lobo consigo que la administración me proteja, me dé de comer. Y de paso, pues me tomé en plan soy yo entre las tiendas de campaña de los turistas y arranplo peré todo lo que encuentre, latas de cerveza, bocadillo, chocolate, tabaco, etc. Porque como soy un lobo y tengo inmunidad para todo, pues hago lo que me salga por los cojones. Entre lo de la cara, para que no me reconozcan, y esto, para que me confundan con un lobo, voy a vivir aquí como un marqués. Pero como un marqués. Así que... Amigos del reality show, estoy esperando por vosotros. Venid cuando queráis, que yo ya os estoy esperando. Siendo pastor no soy en extinción, pero siendo loco estoy en extinción. Así que yo prefiero estar en extinción para que me cuiden, me miren y me den, me den baños de espuma. Ah, hasta luego. My name is John Maynard Case. In 1936, I came up with a term called animal spirits. What is this? Well, animal spirits happen when I go crazy, when I get out of control with all my greed, all my greed, all my ambition, all my ambition, all my need to get lost. So let's take control of ourselves. Let's colonize the animal spirits. This is the language of animal spirits. Done. And then we come up one more. And then we come up one more. Thank <laughs> you.
Now we need your support for the legal battle ahead. The block cheese has vastly more power than the Bitcoin. It is Turing complete, blockchain aware, and it suits pure lactobacterial power. I'll do it again because I missed something. It is coded in a bacteria-based blockchain, value aware. Um, uh, vastly, it has vastly Turing complete value aware. This is an initial coin offering for cheese coin. It builds over the lacto power of lime mold that makes it to be the first smart cheese. Yeah, bacteria start to talk. So. <laughs> That's an extraordinary example of how you weave through animal life. I should say something yeah. about this term of animal spirits mm -hmm. because the whole um, video starts off with John Maynard Keynes in the Berlin Olympic Stadium explaining about his economic concept of animal spirits, which he came up in the same year as the Berlin Olympics, 1936. And this is about basically the emotional aspect of the economy, of emotions such as uh, greed and appetite and uh, wish to succeed or to profit. And this is he calls it animal spirits. There's, of course, a longer tradition of you know talking about animal spirits, but it was about this idea, which sort of, um, well, which has been very um, influential in in uh, recent economic um, events, I guess. So it builds on this sort of ambivalence between different ideas of what animal spirits could be, but also what they are and how they are being repurposed within capitalism. So we see them as characters in a meta version of the crypto Colosseum. We see them as a skin that allows a shepherd to hide uh, from view. Um, the only image we haven't seen is also the animals from the cave. Mm -hmm. um, oh. What does it mean to go back to the Lasco caves? Yeah, yeah. There is also uh, a Lasco cave and all the escaped, you know, digital animals from the uh, crypto Colosseum meet there, and th there is actually animated um, AI gun animated. Um, Paleolithic paintings on the walls of mammoths and bisons and horses and all sorts of animals which are in between, mm -hmm. you know. So they they move on on the walls of this of this cave. I think it's very compelling to see, like, contemp like the contemporary movement kind of clashed with uh, going back to that far in time. Actually. Yeah, you know, I mean, I have been to many of these caves and, uh, you know, this Werner Herzog, of course, had, has compared these sort of 2.5D works to proto-cinema because they are animated by maybe the, the um, fire, you know. So I thought, yeah, let's, let's try and see how they would look like animated. It's interesting because you can could can still train those guns on just individual animals, but the most interesting ones happened when they were all animals sort of in the same training set. And then it would morph from horse to bison to mammoth and that so on. Well, that's a beautiful place to end. Maybe I really make, just want to make sure we have time for questions and comments from the audience. So thank you so much, uh, Hito, for this conversation.
and maybe we have mics that could circulate in the audience. If there are questions. Yes, there's someone. Please. <laughs> Thank you for coming. That was an amazing talk. Like, super cool. I think your work has been super influential for like my essay. There are a couple of questions. Then, um, one is a question. I think in a lot of your work, there is a um, formal and systematic um, aspect of reflection in it. Uh, that's what I see in some of the stuff that you've produced for this book. So my question is, what is the relationship between your work Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's an amazing question. So I started out having a quite, let's say, positive relation to disruption, also from montage, you know, in juxtaposition. So, um, and I started reconsidering it when tech basically took over disruption as a paradigm to grow faster, you know, break things and uh, move on. Uh, I did this other work which is called the City of Broken Windows, actually there's also a short um, quote in Social Sim where I'm <laughs> breaking a window and it's really about this paradigm of disruption because it's a documentary about a bunch of engineers who are breaking windows all day long in a big aircraft hangar and it's their job and what, they, what are they doing? They are breaking those windows to train a neural network to recognize these sounds. Of course, the neural network will call the police, etc. So it's a sort of security application, domestic security application. And um, this is basically disruption made productive, right? And profitable and integrated not into the system as an interruption, but on the contrary, to ensure the utmost functioning by ways of creative disruption. Um, yes, and without any sort of uh, regard for the lives of the people who are getting disrupted. Question. Maybe, maybe I'm also reminded of the l final shot of uh, the empty center when you mm -hmm. come close to the wall and there's this uh, kind of gap that's opened and it's going through the cracks of the walls uh, have been like a motif also. Other questions, comments? Yes, Nelson. Hi, um, in social sim, you use this motif or this metaphor of the the dance mania, and I was wondering if you could just talk more about that, like why you were drawn to that that yeah. metaphor. Um, that was something that started in thousand, I think, thirty six, um, as a literal choreomania that spread in Central Europe along the River Rhine, and it, it was people who started dancing and didn't stop again, and until this day, no one really knows, was it a real disease? Was it a sort of um, psychological contagion? No one knows what happened. And people were literally dancing until they died of exhaustion, some of them at least. So for me, this was an interesting um, event to connect it. I mean, at, at that time, one has to say, it was also very often connected with pogroms, um, violence against Jews mainly at that point in time. So it wasn't like a nice rave or anything like that. It also had elements you know, of extreme violence embedded. And um, it was interesting for me to try to compare it to the sort, as I said earlier, in, uh, the infodemia which happened during the pandemic. At the end of 
the film in the credits, you have a scene from an anti-vax right-wing demonstration in the center of Berlin in front of Brandenburg Gate, who are having their own rave, you know. Um, next door, their Nazi fellows try to storm the parliament, you know, and they are dancing very happily. So I was interested, you know, about this kind of deployment of dancing also. There's also one other example of choreomania, which is being quoted, which is an incident that happened in, I think, 1919, directly after World War I. So there was also the Spanish flu happening, more or less, at the end of the war. And then, as a reaction to all of these calamities, there was a huge dancing mania, you know, where people were just dancing until they fell from exhaustion as a reaction, psychological reaction. Someone over there? Yes. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm so curious to hear more about the manipulation techniques for rebellion squashing. Can you speak more to that? You were about the social sims that you were looking at for, for yes. squashing rebellion. Um, yeah. Let me try to, <laughs> you know, with all this back catalog of works, you know, sometimes it gets really difficult to remember all the details. Um, what other parameters there are for squashing a rebellion? It's the prison term, of course, um, but it's also the amount of nutrition that people get. Um, it's the rebellion, rebelliousness factor. It's also quoted somewhere. Discontent factor. Um, what else was there? Also, the overall lifespan, there's all sorts of different parameters which you can influence to basically. But the, the, the point is that it is made from the perspective of police. <laughs> it's very clearly an instrument that gives a very crude approximation or a very crude suggestion of mechanisms on how to tune it down, you know, by by activating several different um, measures at the same time. There, there was a question here in the center. No? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a question yeah. back there. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for your work. I, I, I think th there is a, a tension between this issue of invisibility being important sometimes and also making things uh, visible. So right now we're having very, very big issues, the ones you uh, talk about in your work and also, well, the environmental mutation or crisis we, we are living. And it's also very dangerous to be an activist. I come from Colombia, which is the, right now the most dangerous country in the world for environmentalist uh, activists. So I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, uh, here you talk about uh, the role of uh, cinema right now, where we're living not only this tension between these issues with representation and invisibility, but also these issues with new representational models and modes of presence in the internet and all that. Mm -hmm. What exactly? So I just want to know what will be your uh, opinion on the role of cinema, maybe uh, how, uh, if it has changed uh, recently, uh, or uh, if uh, you still uh, think that uh, 
some ways of making documentary uh, films are, will be the right ones. I, I, Mm -hmm. Maybe thinking about the times of Haru, uh, Faruqi and the cinema verite and all of that. Mm -hmm. mm. It's hard to give like one single answer. On one hand, I think that you know some form of documentary will always be important. On the other hand, I also think that you know this format is being hollowed out and appropriated from all kinds of different sides. Um, so that, at least from the point of view of its truth value, it's um, in a different, in a difficult situation, definitely. So, but still, I think some of it will uh, continue working. As to this situation of cinema as a whole, I was just in a very interesting situation, um, which I is very ambivalent, but I'm going to tell you. So I was at the film festival in Locarno, and everyone was completely um, going crazy because Clade, Kate Blanchett was not going to come. Yeah, terrible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the main, main topic, Kate Blanchett is not going to come, okay. Why is she not going to come? Because of AI, of course, because of the strike of actors, writers, etc. And I thought it's great, you know, at least actors are unionized, at least writers are unionized, and they still have some clout at the moment, at least. They are not, have not been fully automated, and they know that if they are going to do something, it needs to be now, right? And this was one, one part of my got reaction, like complete solidarity, and on the other hand, there was also the realization coming back to documentary that actually was great, you know, festival without stars, because people started looking at the films again, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, yeah. And they, they were talking about the films and even formal aspects of films. It was incredible, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was something like a byproduct of AI, where I said, oh, maybe it's not so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, you know, you have these sort of paradoxical situations where suddenly through situations which you cannot really anticipate, um, attention is being focused on to films again, and not only on their budget and the stars and you know pff, whether they are Netflix or not, right? But on what what the films really are. So I wouldn't exclude in the future that it's possible, right? But there needs to be this sort of constellation of unforeseeable events for it to happen. Uh, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, so I want to kind of refer back to your um, essay on the poor image. And uh, I've been studying digital archives of the, of the ongoing revolution that's been happening in Iran for the past year, specifically the Women Life Freedom Movement. And uh, during that time that I was kind of closely following the digital archives, um, I came around your essay, and then also I came on the essay of the psychic numbing and genocides of Paul Slovich. Um, I think my main question is that upon my, st my kind of studies of like just these poor images that are being reposted and reshared by many users around different social media platforms, um, for the beginning of the movement, it was extremely helpful in terms of the awareness, um, which kind of was good for the diaspora, but not for the people that were inside, because it didn't really directly affect them. Um, and ultimately, from my colleagues around me, kind of ended up with the psychic numbing of myself included as a person of diaspora, that um, I can't do anything about it, and these are just numbers that are increasing, so I'm just going to turn off my uh, screen, and I'm not going to think about it for a while. So I kind of want to know your opinion in terms of um, what, would you, what do you think is the role of digital activism or digital artistic activism mm. uh, on matters that are strictly related to social reform and to revolutionary movements? Yeah, that's very important. 
a serious question to which there's really no clear answer. You know, I mean, we had this phenomena like this um, since the Arab Spring, since the tens, where basically the coming together of social media, Web2, and rebellions happening created this sort of wave of circulation of protest videos. And in the beginning, there was a lot of hope around it. My colleague, Rabia Mroy, did a very beautiful talk called The Pixelated Revolution, where he deals with this basically issues. Um, I think that after a while, at least in relation to this conflict, this um, hope was very much shattered. And I'm not sure about other protests um, which have been circulated a lot since, whether in the end uh, it has helped or not helped, right? And helped what exactly? Helped the platforms? Yes, definitely. Helped a, sort of a certain short-term attention? Probably, yes. But it has not helped I mean, I'm, I'm now being very general, right? But I think it has not created any sort of organization of structures to oppose whatever, you know, the initial problem is. And um, has also created this enormous exhaustion, you know, of people that are watching these images. I think, I mean, I'm now generalizing from myself, but I definitely feel this almost impossibility of the task of being the witness of everything. It's just not possible. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think of this question now also. So it's not really solvable, right? Because I mean, it, it's completely impossible to tell any sort of social movement right now not to do it, not to post their documentary recordings, etc., on social medias, because it still does something, but is this sustainable? I'm not, I'm not sure. Plus, there is another aspect which I'm now um, starting to explore, because all of these things are now training data, right? They are material on which, you know, new uh, neural networks are being trained, and that also, you know, creates a different kind of situation. They become new raw material for extraction. I mean, they have always been, they were extracted for clicks, for, you know, um, shares, etc. But what is it now that uh, these images have become? It's a sort of amorphous noise, you know, that serves to feed also the new industries of um, digital extraction. And that's a bit scary also, you know, when it comes to image, uh, face, face facial recognition, all of these things. I mean, um, the opportunities for surveillance also rise a lot. The more these images circulate and are being ingested, you know, in the digital, into the digital monopolies. Luca, pardon. Hello. Hi. So thank you very much for your body of work and for uh, coming all the way here. Um, I work in optics. Uh, I'm a physicist. And how not to be seen was um, definitely a revelation in terms of how we see our work as apolitical, but how it is, in fact, very, very political. Um, I have two questions for you. You have previously commented about museums as battlefields, about how decommissioned tanks can be brought back into um, war. And I guess I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts about the um, virtual museums as battlefields would be. And my second question is you have commented about self-generating art. I was wondering um, what your thoughts are about self-generating documentary. Um, and does this overlap with surveillance? And thank you again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. 
you know, this um, story I'm telling about the tank that's being driven down from the pedestal and driven into the battlefield that has now been so overtaken by reality, I mean completely, right? Uh, apparently last week five, five tanks were driven uh, out of a Danish museum to go to Ukraine. So I, I think that's now absolute standard, right? It's nothing extraordinary. It's nothing out of the norm. It is the norm that basically museum and battlefield are very closely related and um, approximated. Um, how about virtual museums? I don't know, actually. I don't know yet. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> No, because they, you know, during the pandemic, there was this whole push, you know, everything's going to be virtual, and then it's all stopped because no one liked it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure yet what the, I mean, I can give you one example. I'm, I'm thinking while I'm speaking. There is a software company called Palantir, California, um, that is now, that was always big in big data, surveillance, etc., has now moved into um, warfare um, through artificial intelligence, um, combining different databases, etc., providing um, reconnaissance, mainly. They are already active in Ukraine and so on. <laughs> and they have now, I mean, I know for years they have tried to become art sponsors, They've contacted, you know, different art spaces and art spaces, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> but they had a big show in Germany last year. They managed finally, you know, to establish themselves as art sponsors for big digital immersive art installations using, I don't know, neural networks or something like that. And they used it very actively to promote their new, you know, um, new tool. So I think this is maybe one of the first examples where these two things start to converge or to come together slowly, but I think it's not fully, um, fully expanded yet. And what was the second question again? Um, you mentioned self-generating art. I was wondering oh, what you think about self-generating documentary, yeah. A good question. I mean, in, in a way, some of the reality TV is exactly that, right? You plant some sort of dynamics and then you see how it evolves, or you pretend you see how it evolves in reality, you of course direct it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think basically that's already the social sim in a nutshell for television. So in that sense, it exists to some degree. Oui, le temps passe. The time is running. Is there a last question? Um, my question is quite open, but I was just wondering the role of humor in your work and to return to the first question that was asked about disruption. I kind of wonder if humor has a disruptive or a kind of a potential to uh, produce like something new or a new sentiment that exists outside of modeling. Uh, it's a very vague, <laughs> but that's it. No, I mean, mainly, you know, I have to, it, I also have to feel some pleasure in making things, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be very hard. <laughs> yeah, so it's fully selfish. I apologize. <laughs> I'm not doing it to do something. I'm doing it to have a laugh on my, <laughs> on my lonely laptop. <laughs> Maybe if I may ask mm -hmm. a question, uh, just in relation to your latest work, human figure or human agency is more and more remote, and you've been exploring 
animal spirits, the presence of real animals or bacteria or even plant agency in your uh, la latest piece that was at the Hayward Gallery. And I'd like to hear you more about like this kind of uh, withdrawal of maybe your, even your own agency within your work. Yeah, I mean, you know, starting from social simulation, I became very fascinated with live input, you know, either, you know, from people, sensorial input, or from plants. And um, yes, and my last work is uh, only generated by plants. The bioelectricity is measured, turned into music, etc. Um, yeah, yeah, because people are kind of exhausting. <laughs> I need a short break, you know, just turn away, smell some plants, okay? <laughs> now I can go back to doing so give you a break then. <laughs> I think that's a good place to stop. <laughs> Thank you, Ito and Jiyun, for this uh, amazing discussion and for this trip also. Um, so you can visit uh, uh, the exhibition Social Sim at PVM until October 22nd. Also, at the Goethe Institute on Saint Laurent Boulevard, you can see the video Strike. It's on, uh, in the vitrine, so you have until Sunday to go uh, by. Uh, also, uh, the Max and Iris Stern International Symposium is on September 28 and 29. It's organized by the MAC at the CCA, and Jiyun will present a roundtable. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.